Happy Diwali to all of you. Welcome to this monthly lecture series of Party Chairman. We meet here once a month, typically first Sunday of the month. Uh, thank you for coming. And it's a busy day. Uh, appreciate all that. And we also have the schedule for the next five months. It is in your flyer. You can check it out. Uh, the next one is going to be on the 1st of December. But we have the entire calendar published uh, for the next five months that is in your flyer. But today we are here to uh, listen to Swami Bodha Nathaji. Uh, he has come here once before, so we are very happy that he has come again. Uh, Swami Bodha Nathaji, a uh, little bit of introduction about him. Uh, he is the founder of the Sambodh Society. They have a headquarter in uh, Michigan. And before the US chapter was founded, uh, Swami Bodha Nathaji has spent a significant amount of time uh, after receiving his uh, Diksha Sanyas in 1978. Uh, after several years of intense study, he embarked on his mission of teaching and he was assigned the responsibility of setting up a center, Sandeepani in Kerala. And since 1978, he has been very active and he has come to the US several times and now his head headquarters is in Michigan. Uh, he is an author of several books. Uh, the most prominent ones right now you see are The Indian Management and Leadership, The Gita and Management. Some of the books are available in the back. Uh, you, can, you can see them there or you can also order the books online at www.sambodh.us. Uh, Swamiji is a well-known uh, well management guru. He has received his master's degree in economics is well versed in the contemporary challenges of the corporate leadership as well as corporate management. And his two books are highly recommended for our audience. Uh, he specializes in Advaita Vedanta, Yoga Sutra, Bhagavad Gita and Upanishads and various other aspects. So please welcome Swami Bodhanam. Thank you very much. So today's uh, topic is being and uh, being different. A Hindu approach to the identity question. And we have been hearing a lot about the Hindu identity. Some people say there is nothing called the Hindu. That's a word borrowed from Iranians and we should not use that word. It doesn't denote anything. And uh, some other people say no. The word Hindu is used by one billion people to refer themselves. And it's their privilege to use whatever they word, whatever word they want to represent themselves. So let's not go into that kind of a dispute or a quarrel, let us say. We all accept that Hindu dharma or Hindu religion, to me dharma and religion mean the same thing. Dharma means that which sustains and that which binds and that's the meaning of religion, re lagare, re means to deepen, lagare means to bind. So etymologically dharma and religion mean the same thing. So the word Hindu Dharma or Hindu religion or Hinduism it used by us to represent a set of people and they constitute one-sixth of humanity and uh, so what do they represent? And if I ask you what's your religion I'm sure you will say 
Hindu dharma, Hindu religion. Very few people say Sanatana dharma or Varnashrama dharma or Yogi dharma or Vedic dharma. Very few people say. It has been historically accepted that Hindu dharma represent a, a religious worldview. So having settled that is good, just to say, we all are Hindus. And in India, generally we don't face this question, who is a Hindu? What is a Hindu? Can you define your religion? Because it is understood who is a Hindu. But when you come to a foreign country, like America, And you see a different uh, religion, different kinds of people, different lifestyles, different <coughs> value systems, and you have to explain yourself. Then the question comes, who are we? And what does Hinduism mean? Because we have to represent, we have to explain ourselves. Because we are doing things differently. We worship different gods, we read different books, we eat uh, different kinds of food. Every year, if possible, we go to India and come back. And our complexion is different. However, you try to change your complexion and your look. And it is going to be that way. So it is, it become incumbent upon us that we become self-conscious about our religious beliefs, about our lifestyle, about who we are. And that's how the question of identity comes. What do I identify? What is my sotto, my invariable nature? And not only me, people like me. So I am an individual, as an individual, who am I? And belonging to a group, what are we? So what are we and who am I? That question is very, very important. So we become self-conscious. We want to know who we are and we want to assert and we want to say and justify what we are and why we are. So that's how this question becomes problem. Especially when we travel, people ask these questions. Our children, born here and brought up here, they are facing such questions. And they come home and they ask these questions. Why are we worshipping an elephant head of God? Or why are we worshipping the monkey face of God? Why are we pouring water or milk and ghee on, in fire or on Shivalika? Why are we worshipping this stone? Especially in a culture where image worship is looked down on. It's satanic worship. So children face that question and they feel humiliated because they are not able to explain themselves. And since they are not able to explain themselves, not only they feel humiliated, they feel low self-worth. And as a result, they are not able to think independently. They always look for recognition and approval and appreciation. And if that doesn't come, then they feel again lost self work So we lose our leadership capabilities. That's why the Hindu here never become a leader. He doesn't go to business or entertainment or sport, sports or politics. Because these are all dangerous lines which require self-confidence. The Hindu here doesn't go to politics or military or some such risky area of human activity because of this law self -worth. So our children and grandchildren become glorious coolies. They employ, they are employed by others, less qualified. They are because they are capable, but they are not conscious of their own capability. Like Hanuman, somebody has to tell. 
So this question keeps on coming when, when, when I travel all over this country and across the world. We face this question, who are we as Hindus? And we keep on giving explanations that Hinduism is not a religion, Hinduism is a way of life, that Hindus have no textbook, or they have many textbooks, or their whole like, library is there. Or Hindus are no founder or leader. Hindus are a very loose confederation of faiths. And Hindus are never aggressive, they never conquered. You know, these kind of escapist explanations are given. Because we have to explain some way who we are. So it is time for us to sit down and engage in a dialogue and a conversation among ourselves, an intra-group conversation among ourselves. A conversation is necessary. And this is part of that conversation. Because the issues are not yet settled, it was not verbalized. We know we are Hindus, that is clear. But we don't know what to be a Hindu what it is to be like being a Hindu. So these issues are to be discussed. Not that we will have a final and ultimate answer, but we can go towards an answer. At least we have some explanation. So, and hence the question of identity. What is our being? What is our being mean? What is our invariable nature? which keep on appearing in different forms and different guises as we interact with changing situations. What's our ascension? And how are we different, being different? And in what areas we differ? And what value we bring into the global community? As individuals and as a group, what value we bring into the global community? That question also is very good. That's why being and being different. First of all, we have to design and decide what is our being, what is our nature, invariable nature, and what value we bring into the term, and how are we different, and why are we different, and what is the value of being different. Because when we interact with the people, they are going to explain themselves. And it looks sometimes they are superior than us. So we don't want to be different, we want to want to look the same. You want to speak in the same accent, eat the same food, dress the same way, and change our name. At least get a citizenship. So we have to explain all this. And that occurs a conversation. Because we are kitchen kitchen. We don't have a central authority to explain to us, which is good. So that we all can participate in that conversation. And as a result of that conversation, some idea has to march. So this is part of that conversation. So first of all, let us have some understanding about what identity means. What is the meaning of identity? And what does it imply? Because before we answer a question, we should know what is the content of that question. There is no point in hurriedly answering that question. So what does identity mean? Identity can mean several things. One meaning of identity is, how do you represent yourself? How do you verbalize yourself? What is your self-representation? And the self-representation, and that you are owner of your own self-representation. You don't have to tell me who I am. I have to tell you who I am, what I am and who I am. So I don't have to look around asking a Freud or a Marx or a Darwin to ask him, tell me who I am. They may have their own answers. A Darwin may say you are a monkey because you are descended of monkeys. A Marx may say you are nothing but a, a, a result of, a, of productive relationships. 
or a four wheel race say you are nothing but a bundle of suppressions and repressions. There can be different also different depending upon their philosophical outlook. So the ultimate uh, custodian of that answer is you yourself. I have to answer who I am. I have to respond to that question. So it is a self-representation. It is a self-expression. It can, it can come out in words, it can come out in actions, it can come out in desires, it can come out in imaginations, it can manifest in different ways. But I have to represent myself as an individual, as well as a group. So we Hindus have to say who we are. And as a member of that Hindu community, I have to say who I am. Because in the Hindu community, there are individuals. There are subsets. For example, there are South Indians, North Indians, East Indians, West Indians, Punjabis, Hindi Walas, Madrasis as the Hindi Walas call them. All those kind of people are there. And there are subgroups. And among them there are various castes and divisions and classes with different historical backgrounds. So they all have to announce who they are within that group. And as they announce themselves, there can be a commonality arising on it. That's why when a Christian comes to this country, he's a Christian from Kerala. But he finds more affinity with me, he comes to my lectures than going to a church because there is similarity, commonality. He's a Christian. In India, we don't see eye to eye. But when we come here, we see eye Or a Muslim and a Hindu going to Saudi Arabia. And when Saudi Arabia send back people, because they don't want to employ them, send them back here, they all come together. Malayali Muslims and Malayali Hindus come together and say, this is a common problem. So within the Hindu community, there are individuals, there are subgroups, they have their own representation. And they will be talking among themselves. So it's a very complex, very rich, very layered concept, identity. So but we have to announce who we are. The Hindu have to announce who he is. And as an individual in the Hindu community, he has this right to say. Oh, yes. So it is identity is self-representation. And it can be acquired identity and it can be inherited identity. For example, when you are born in India, in a Hindu family, then you are a Hindu. It is something inherited. But when you come to America and become an American citizen, and in that process, you have to become American citizen, you want to become the president of the country, so you change your religion, possible. And then, you change your religion, you have a new identity. But your own identity is not lost. You are only laid it with a new identity. So there is an identity which you acquire, an identity which you inherit. So we have these two this is how we understand the meaning of identity. The first is, it is a self-representation. You express who you are. And you are in your identity which you cannot give up. And you can acquire, you can put layers on top of that, like a pizza effect as they say. You can put layers on that and you can look at the thing. You can say, you can even get from water. But even if you convert, your old, what you have inherited cannot change, it's there. You cannot forget it, it's there. So thus you have acquired an identity and inherited. And another aspect of identity is, identity is not fixed. It is a fluid concept. You cannot essentialize identity. As human beings, you can say, I am a human being. That identity is there. But 
But as a human being, you keep on changing. So your identity is, though there is certain kind of, certain continuity, certain invariableness about your identity, but it can keep on changing. Human beings, because it's a conscious entity, he can recreate himself. For example, a lion is a lion all the time. A lion cannot become a vegetarian. A cow is a cow all the time. A cow cannot become a non-vegetarian. But you and I can become vegetarian, non-vegetarian, and uh, omnivorous, herbivorous, and uh, carnivorous, locavorous, all kind of virus is, is possible. So, our identity, because we are self-conscious, we have the will, we have the conscience, we have the power to change ourselves if necessary. We can reimagine ourselves by the power of consciousness and your creativity. So identities. So for Hindu identity, it has been changing. Though it has been changing, there is something binding us. That's what we call also Hindus. So once upon a time we were fire worshippers, then sun worshippers, now we are Shiva worshippers. So the, the, the content can change, the contours can change, but still there is something. What in 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 what it be said, pravaha nitya There is some kind of a continuity, but things are going a change. So your identity is not a fixed identity. If you are a fixed identity, then you are like a piece of stone. You are not a human being. A human being has the power to change. So Hindus are not fixed to fossilize in the past. For so that matter, no human being, no human community can be fossilized in the past. We are all the time changing. Things are constantly changing. And we have to adapt, which is some of one of the survival secrets. We have been changing. We have been learning. We have been unlearning, relearning. We are learning from others. We are teaching others. All those things are happening. So identity is not like uh, something written on stone. A stone may remain the same, even stones change. Because of the effect of rain and wind and sun and all that, even stones change, mountains change, individuals change. So it is a kind of a flow. And still, you can generally identify, in spite of all of the changes. That's another idea aspect of identity. And the third aspect of identity is that identity is complex. And identity means identification. You have to identify with something, some values, some images, some memory, some history. So there is an identification with a memory. We all share the same memory with a little variation. So we identify with the memory, our history, common history, we identify with it. We identify with the certain sacred places. When you hear the word Kashi, something happens to you. Isn't it? But the, your neighbor, nothing happens to you. Kashi doesn't mean anything. When you say Krishna, something happens to you but not your neighbor. So, we have certain identification with certain values, with certain morals, with certain a concept of what is good and bad. What Ravana did was wrong, what Rama did was right. We have certain identification and where we share. So there are shared values. So identity means identification, something which you have which is valuable. If there is no identification, there is no pure identity. There is no pure identity. It's all based related to identification. Values. Sense of what is right and wrong. All these are very, very important. Symbols. Nostalgia. Something which creates nostalgia in us, isn't it? We all feel nostalgic about our home country. That's why you I, I hear people constantly saying, Sam, next year I'm, 
I am going back to my children. Or when my children are grown up, I will And still you are there. Why, 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 why have you not gone back? Because my grandchildren are small. You never go back, but you live in nostalgia. You always think, I am going back. So the nostalgia is there. The memory is vision. History vision. Certain symbols we say, certain icons we share, certain philosophical ideas we share. For example, the karma thing we share. Whether it is right or wrong, we share. For fire worship, we share. So there are certain things which we share, which are related, which are valuable to us. So identity means identification. Without that, there is no identity. Then, identity also means recognition. And identity means being part of There is somebody different in me. And with reference to that different somebody, I, I am what I am. So to be myself, I have to be a counterpoint. It is with reference to you, I am myself. So therefore, the other is always there. That's why we always say, me and the other, we and the other. And I always look for recognition from the other. Without that recognition, I don't feel complete. That's why there is an article about Modi in the New York Times, we all are up, uh, against, uh, up in arms against that. Why did he say that? Because we need recognition for, from New York Times. We need recognition from others. So the need for recognition is there. Identity means there is the other. And the other has to recognize me. So there is mutual reciprocal recognition necessary, respect necessary. If you don't respect me, I keep doubting about myself. If you call me a donkey, I always, maybe it's true. But I need a recognition. If that recognition is not coming, I feel incomplete. So identity means, along with that, there is the other. So that dialectics you cannot avoid. That dualism you cannot avoid. And the need for recognition you cannot avoid. If you don't get a recognition consistently from the other, you feel less. You feel So there is need for mutual and finally, identity means, since there is the other, identity is always a space where conflicts are balanced. We find in the, in the core of our identity, there is always conflict. There is always two ideas. For example, we, let us take the Hindu identity. There is always a conflict in the very heart of our identity. If you have seen the latest uh, Mahadev, anyone of you have, have seen that? On the Shiva, Mahadev. It's a, it's a, it's a uh, Syrian Mahadev. It begins with a conflict between Dacha and Shiva. That conflict is central to Hindu identity. That is what the dynamism of Hindu identity. Daksha is a rule abiding, law abiding, very organized, very clean, very clear person. And Shiva is rule breaking, law breaking, living in the burial ground, all the time meditating, nothing to do with the family. So Shiva is the counterpoint of Daksha. So there is a central dualism, duality, or dialectics in the core of all our identities. And it is that dialectic which keeps us alive and growing and emerging into new new identities. So all the dialectics of the Vedas and the Upanishads, the Vedas talk about rituals, the Upanishads talk about meditation. Rituals are, can take you so far, but thereafter meditation. So the conflict between meditation 
and activity, Vedas and the Upanishads, or the Yoga and the Vedic philosophy. There is always a conflict. Or the Buddha and the, the Brahmi and the Shamanic tradition. It is through that conflict we are unfolding ourselves. So it is never one sided of way activity. So we always go through that conflict. We always go through the dialectics. And the dialectics are healthy. The dialectics is not to be avoided. And if you opt for one permanently, then you are dead. Then that civilization will die. So any healthy civilization should be quite more and more such dialectical, conflictual situation. So in our encounter, the Hindus encounter with Western civilization, a new dialectic does come. Because the Hindu world view is very cyclical. It's a cyclical world. Srishti is the Dilaya. Things will manifest, grow to a certain stage of maturity, then it will decline. Cyclical. Everything is cyclical. Whereas the Western world is linear, binary, progress. We have no idea of progress. The Western world has introduced that idea. So we are going through that conflict. That conflict is good. That dialectic is equal. So in the heart of any living tradition, there will be this dialectic. In fact, Bhagavad Gita begins with uh, that dialectics, that conflict. Arjuna asked the first thing. Jaya si jat karmanaste madhavutir janardana tat kim karmani ghore mahi yodhi On one side you say you are Brahman, you are Uparvay. Or pervasive Brahman and, uh, and uh, bliss and uh, timeless consciousness and all that. On the other side, you say, therefore, Uttishta Gaudde, Yudhai, Pradhanishtaya. On one side, you say non violent, other side, you say violence, and uh, tell me one thing of these two. Krishna never answers to that directly. He says, I, I, I teach both. I teach both. Logesmin divida nishta pura prokta mayanada. Jnana yogena samgyana karma yogena yogina. Again, he asks the same question to Krishna. Same question. So, this dialectics between action and inaction, meditation and activity, this dialectics goes on. And that conflict will always be. And the conflict can be resolved only by action in time and space. When you involve in action in time and space, you have to resolve the one, you have to do some action. And Krishna says no action is complete and perfect. No action is complete and perfect. You have to do action all the time, but nothing is perfect, nothing is complete. Nothing is perfect. Just that there is no fire without smoke. No perfect action. So the conflict between all these opposing standpoints are resolved in action temper. So the importance of action is the inside. So identity means conflict. You cannot avoid conflict. There is intra-group conflict. There is intergroup conflict. There will be conflict in the heaven in Hindus. And we have to encourage that conflict. We have to encourage that dispute. If there is no dispute, there is no dialogue. After all, Indians are arguing in the It's good. We have to engage in our arguments are necessary. Not only among us, you also have to engage in argument between religions between culture, between civilization. That is how we learn, unlearn, relearn, and unfold our full potential through historical processes. So having understood this, that these are the various ways we have to understand the meaning of identity. And we have a certain identity, the Hindu so what are the some of the signing features of this? That's what I have introduced in the book. The book is there 
the Hindu dharma for the 21st century. That's a 400 page book. This is meant for Hindus living here. How do you understand your dharma and explain yourself? First, you explain yourself. Because Hindu dharma is a very big forest. The dharma are in the kitta pranamana, big forest. So somebody has to codify all that. Somebody has to give you some working understanding. And very few people have done that. So we have made an attempt to, 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 to codify Hindu dharma for the Hindus living here in the United States. And whatever acceptable in the United States, we can export back to India. Vivekananda was exported. First he came here, then exported, then he became popular. Otherwise, nobody was listening to him. So we have to bring it here, repackage, then take it back. So whether we do that or not, we need people living here a way of understanding themselves as Hindus in the context of a multicultural, multi-religious society, a society which uh, which is very successful, American society is supposedly very successful, GDP is thousand dollars, where our GDP is only hundred thousand, thousand dollars. So therefore nobody listens to us. The Hindus have no respect because they are not wealthy. They are not wealthy. When you are wealthy, people will listen to you. Hindus are not respected because they are not powerful. Merely raising your voice doesn't give you power. You need backup. You have to have the support. You have, you need a real power. So we have to be powerful, you have to be wealthy, and knowledge is wealth. Knowledge is wealth. So we have to understand ourselves in this successful, competitive society and explain ourselves. So we have made an attempt in that book. That book deals with the issues, eight challenges, or eight items, let us say. The first is the core of Hindu religion is Sanatana. Something eternal. And the core of Sanatana Dharma is two. Satyam, Ahimsa, and sharing what they have. Pursuit of truth in a non-violent way and the readiness to sacrifice all that you have for that pursuit. Satyam, Ahimsa, and Dhyam. So pursuit of truth in a non-violent way means by promoting pluralism. That's not mine. The truth, nobody has any complete hold over truth. People can have opinions. People can have uh, ideas. But nobody can have an absolute hold over truth. Which is said in the Vedas, Ehrnsa, Vipra, Bhuta, Truth can have many faces. So we all are perceiving truth in our own way. And it has to be done in a context of pluralism, multiplicity, where there is a clash of ideas, give you more greater understanding of truth. As they said, truth is the clash of ideas. So we all are perceiving truth, which Mahatma Gandhi said, Satyagraham, desire for truth, grasping truth. Or the Muntaka Prishu said, so truth, whatever it is, we are not defined what truth is, but we have an idea, we have an implied meaning, we have an implied understanding of the word truth. We may not understand it fully. 
So therefore, our pursuit is for truth. And that is to be done non-violently, meaning by promoting different ideas. The more the different, the better you are class for the truth. So therefore, the great victim, Arno, Patra, Kadavu, Promote diversity. Celebrate that. Celebrate multiplicity. Celebrate pluralism. Celebrate different ideas. That's how we reach the penultimate truth. And it's an ongoing process. And ahimsa, satya, and tyagam. Tyaga is you are ready to pay any price for that. You are ready to pay any price for the realization. You are ready to discipline yourself for the realization. And hence, Brahmacharya is an important value in the Hindu tradition. Brahmacharya can be discipline. Brahmacharya means Indriya Dekra. Everybody says that. All religion, all uh, denomination in India highlight Brahmacharya. Whereas when you come to the Western civilization, Brahmacharya doesn't have any value. Most of the Western philosophers are emotionally wretched, emotionally disturbed people, emotionally bad people. They have no control. These days they talk about emotional intelligence, but that's a new addition because they have interaction with the Dalai Lama. Otherwise, there's no emotional intelligence. Whereas the Eastern tradition gives a lot of importance to emotional intelligence, discipline, self-control. So our creativity comes from self-control, not sexual indiscipline. But most of the Western philosophers, they are sexually indisciplined. You take any philosophy, including the Trumpers. But India's attitude is not that India is against sexual activities, but discipline. Emotional discipline is important for us. That's the meaning of tapas. So, ahimsa, satyam, and sanatana. Ahimsa, satyam, akrodaha, tyagam, eta, chatushtaya, ajada, shatro, seva, sva, dharma, eta, Ahimsa, satyam, akrodaha, Yadamayatar Chatushtaya, Ajada Shatru Sevasva, Dharma Mayanasana. And this Sanatana Dharma, this pursuit, everybody has to be involved in that pursuit. That pursuit is to be done in an embodied state. It's not done by a, just an isolated individual in a cave. It's not a disengaged, isolated, Enterprise. It is an embodied, enfolded enterprise. You are in this body and you are in the world. With all the problems involved in that. So therefore you are in the body, you are in the world, you are in the community, you are in the context of the culture. Wherever you go, you cannot take it out. The cultural influence you cannot take out of you. So in that context, you are a situated individual, a conditioned individual. So as a situated individual in a certain culture, with a certain cultural background, how do you engage in this pursuit of truth? How do you encourage a diversity? And how do you discipline yourself? How much? When discipline becomes a suppression and oppression and, uh, and uh, uh, distorts your personality, you should know that. So therefore, this pursuit is to be intelligently developed, intelligently done. And for that, we have the Varna Ashrama Vavastha. So the Varna Ashrama Vavastha explained to you, how do you pursue truth, being an involved and embodied and incarnate person belonging to a certain culture. Because everybody belongs to certain culture. 
even when you read the Western people, they talk from the background of the Western tradition, their language. That language is very important. That tradition is very important. When you talk about India, Hindus talk about it, they are talking a different style. So therefore, the Varna, Ashrama, Vavastha. Varna means your temperament. What is your temperament? What is your prakriti? What are your vasanas? What is your identity? Varna and Ashrama, your age. Of course, your age also decides what should you do, when should you do, in what force you should do. So, Varna, Ashrama, Vavastha. Accordingly, you have to pursue this. And in the process, of course, you have to fulfill your basic needs. And how do you do that? How do you fulfill your basic needs? How do you ensure your survival being a seeker of truth? Seeker of seeking truth is our ultimate goal. But how do you ensure survival? Because you need a body to seek truth. A cultural body as well as a biological body. What do you need? to seek truth. Without that, seeking truth is not possible. So that puts at another kind of discipline, which is discussed in the Varna Ashrama. So then the third point, some of our pet beliefs. One of our pet beliefs, the belief in the karma is. How do you explain it is a different question. It can be explained in various ways. But that's a pet theory. That you as an entity survive the end of the body, the destruction of the body. It's not that one life, you have several lives. You can explain it in various ways. You can say you have the freedom to recreate yourself on an ongoing basis. You can recreate your egos as you encounter the changing, challenging situations. Or you can say after the end of the body you you exist. So that karma theory gives you a wealth of explanatory tools to explain your condition, your situation. So theory of karma is something very central to the Hindu wisdom tradition. And as a result, we are able to relate to the other life forms also. Because sometimes the theory of karma says after death you may become a stone or a tree or a mosquito or a, or a crocodile. So when you see a mosquito and then crush the mosquito between your hands, sometimes you think maybe I am crushing my grandpa. It develops a certain sensitivity. It develops a certain sensitivity. It expands your awareness. It makes you more empathetic and sympathetic to other living creatures. So let us exploit that tool, that karma theory, in its, in its many, many explanatory ways. It's not only really one single explanation for that. But it's very powerful. They do believe me. So other powerful uh, belief for Hindu is worshipping God in a certain image. Because for us, the whole world is an incarnation of God. Every being in the world is a manifestation of God. And not only that, we also believe God can manifest in a form desired by the devotee. Because the devotee's prayer can become a vehicle for God to manifest or the Brahman to manifest. Therefore, Krishna, Rama, all those incarnations. Not only Krishna, Rama. You can become a piece of stone. And with the use of mantras and various other rituals, you can empower it and you can make it a vehicle for God Brahman to manifest again, which we call our Charada. That also is a manifestation. This is a unique uh, belief in the, in the Hindu tradition. And we, that's very dear to us. And in fact, I find in, in America, the face of Hinduism is Murti Puja. Not Vedanta. How many people listen to Vedanta? Very few people. When I gave a lecture on Vedanta, only three people, including the speaker. 
<laughs> but if I do a ritual in my temple, thousands are. Thousands are. They may come with their own questions also. Why do you pour milk? Why do you do this? All those questions. But they participate. Because the murti is a visual description of divinity. The book is a verbal description. And the visual description is more powerful than verbal description. You have to visualize everything there, isn't it? You have to put in everything in colors. Then a lot of people understand it. So, murti puja is very central. Temple worship is very central. That is what at least, at this point, keep Hinduism going. In not even karma theory. Karma theory normally explore, explore the full potential of the karma theory. No Hindu explores that full potential. But murti puja, every. If you put a murti somewhere, people need to So, another important aspect of our identity. And the next one is gurus. Gurus also are very, very important. Because Hinduism is a living religion, not a book bound religion. Not the last prophet or a one only forgotten son. That's not Hinduism. So it's a living tradition. So we need a living tradition to interpret it. And you get a guru whom you deserve. If you if you are a a uh, person seeking uh, <coughs> personal selfish motives, you get such a guru. Guru will say, come to me, I will do some magic and I will give you this and that. And that and you will follow that guru. That's your problem. Hmm. Unfortunately, there is no quality check in our country. For everything else, a quality check for guru, there is no quality check. Whereas Shankaracharya, the Upanishad says, in the way to he says, gurus also have to be, have to have a quality. A guru is one who, who, who has studied the scripture at the feet of another guru. Shrotriyam Brahmanishnam. He should have studied the scripture, not independently, but from some other. From Sampradaya Vidha, from a certain traditional uh, uh, discipline, he should have done. And not only that, one who experiences what he teaches. Not only that, who has no demand on you. If he makes a demand on you, then he is not a good. Therefore, his needs should be minimal. So one whose needs are minimal, one who is trained in the scripture, and one who is established in his knowledge, he alone has the right to be a good. So there are certain tests. Criteria is there. But we don't employ it because we are greedy. We need a few crucials. We ourselves are indisciplined. We want a guru who will say what we want to hear. So therefore you all are misguided. That's your problem, not our problem. So we need the guru. Gurus are very, very important. Guru is a person who, who symbolizes the teaching. Acharya. So I am Acharati, Paranacharya. And guru has no Guru cannot have keep it those clothes. Should be always open. When the Guru keeps the doors open, he cannot play double game. So it should be an open book. So when all these conditions are fulfilled, then he said, those gurus are important for Hinduism. Without the gurus, Hinduism cannot flourish. That's another. Which is different from the other but traditionally there is only one guru, Muhammad, Christ, that's it, that's another. Whereas we, we can have so many Muhammads and so many Christ. As many Muhammads we want, we can have here. So that's another important aspect of Hindu identity. And the third is, the scriptures and their interpretations are very, very important. We also have scriptures. He also, Shankara has determined three important scriptures. And Shankara as a watermark, was a watermark in our Hindu tradition. After Vyasa, Shankara Acharya, 8th century. 
see the truth. From this forest of Hindu religion, he has decided three scriptures. The Bhagavad Gita, the Upanishad, and the Brahma Sutra. And thereafter, all the gurus interpreted these three texts. So our scripture made interpretation. It's a, we need an interpretation of strategy for. Because our religion, our God is enmeshed with the world. Therefore, there is no division between worldly knowledge and spiritual knowledge in Hinduism. All knowledges are equally valid. All knowledges are equally sacred. So therefore, our religious understanding is to be updated all, all the time, depending upon the new knowledges that are arising as human consciousness evolves. So that requires continuous interpretation of the scriptures. And that can be done only with the gurus who live in the society in the community, not in the days. So our scriptures need interpretation. Bhagavad Gita needs interpretation. Depending upon that, interpretation means you have to imbibe new knowledge and then interpret. Therefore, scriptures and their interpretation are very important. It's not a verbal interpretation because our scriptures are very, very symbolic. Whereas it's very easy to interpret a Bible or a Quran because what is written, that's it. It's historical. This is mystical. So therefore, we need an interpretation. And another aspect of Hinduism is the caste system. Apart from the word Nashrama, it's a caste system. What is caste system? We have to understand. We don't have to be apologetic about it. We have to explain what it is. And the white caste system. And of course, people are divided into different types, different castes, depending upon their profession, their education, their temperament, their state of evolution, and all that. And accordingly, so caste system means people are different, that's it. People are different, by whatever reason. And those differences have to be accepted. There need not be discrimination based on caste, which is not acceptable. All castes are, they have to respect each other. There should be respect, no discrimination or caste-based exploitation. There should be respect. So there is competition between these various castes and possible. So we have to understand what caste is. People are different. So as we promote the differences, and that difference means what you eat, how you dress, how you comb your hair, how do you dress, what you speak, what language, what you want to worship, all these can be different. You promote the differences deliberately. But there is no discrimination. So caste system is to be understood. That's something very unique to Hinduism. And finally, we need a way of interacting with other thought systems. Maybe the Western thought, maybe Islam, Christianity, Marxism, Freudianism, whatever. We, we should not be shy of interacting with and you cannot simply say, I don't want to talk with you because you are criticizing me. You criticize me, so I am happy to talk with you. I, I welcome your criticism. You bring your theories and criticize. And I can learn something from you. You can learn something from me. So we need a strategy of engaging in interreligious and interdisciplinary discussions and dialogue. Need not be. How do you do that? That also I have said in that book. So these various aspects of Hinduism interpreted for for me. Western mind is put in that book. It's a 400 page book, and it cost only 50 dollars for one copy. And I want you to buy five copies each. Five, not one. One copy doesn't have. Five copies and distribute to others. 
you know, instead of buying, buying a mixi and giving it as a gift or something useless. I just make up this and give to every Hindu I don't say this is the final answer to Hindu question, but this is a beginning. I don't see any other. I have seen Raji Malhotra's one being different. It's very abstruse and abstract and it's all written in the Western terminologies. In the Western, it's a useless book. It doesn't happen. Because the terminology is used there and the idioms used there, all Western. It doesn't enlighten us. It doesn't come from the very heart of Hindu religion. It is written by a person who has diasporic paranoia. You know, when you are living in a different culture, you are scared. You have a self-respect. And from that standpoint, that doesn't help us. That doesn't help us. What you need is a book written from the core of Hindu tradition. And that's this book. So I would like you to buy this book and uh, help me in my work and, uh, and send this book to as many people as possible. Uh, we have brought to 24, 24 copies and I want you to all of you buy, finish those today, sir. Buy them. So this is the book. Hindu Dharma of the 21st century. Interpretations, innovations, and issues. This is co-edited by, by me and one professor, Raman Ananda Raman, who was uh, uh, a nuclear physicist in, uh, in East Lansing Engineering University. And we together wrote this book, and there are many contributors to this book. So I would like to buy this book by Corpus H. So thank you very much. So, quick question.